Hello. Okay, so when I uh, talked about a modern utopia, I hadn't finished uh, the book. I had a chapter in an appendix yet to go. And uh, the appendix turned out to be the most interesting part of the book. Um, sort of one of those, even a co strange coincidence, because it's about uh, the fact that evidently Wells, in 1905, uh, already uh, found that objective classification was insufficient. He wrote about that and also about um, making uh, negatives into assertive positives. These are all things I've talked about, maybe not as efficiently. So it's it's a funny essay, and also it, it this 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 phrase um, about objective classification uh, is uh, exactly what women fire and dangerous things is about. Only this is you know two inches, and this is. Um, I don't know, a couple pages. And it's a paper that Wells read um, to the Oxford Philosophical Society in November 8, 1903. So I'm, I'm going to read it. I guess I'm in a reading to you mood. Okay. So this is H.G. Wells, 1903. Okay, at this point I, I started reading from the beginning and there was some interesting uh, autobiographical stuff about how he came to the to his ideas um, but I'll let you read the essay for that uh, instead I went on uh, and got sort of the philosophical part I think it is philosophical as lead up it's like he explains what how he came to learn biology and anthropology and, you know natural uh, world kind of um, uh, you know uh, developmental uh, physiology and embryology and stuff so through the biological uh, education, he already had his idea about the concrete world uh, and was just a positivist by default, and he describes how he finally came to study philosophy and then uh, I'll start with his um, with his conclusion which is that, you know objective categorization is broken, and that's what this book is about, that I saw the book I'm reading my opening skepticism is essentially a doubt of the objective reality of classification. I have no hesitation in saying that is the first primary proposition of my philosophy. I have it in my mind that classification is a necessary condition of the working of the mental implement, but that it is a departure from the objective truth of things, that classification is very serviceable for the practical purposes of life, but a very doubtful preliminary to those fine penetrations the philosophical purpose and its more arrogant moods demands. All the peculiarities of my way of thinking derive from that. A mind nourished upon an anatomical study is, of course, permeated ooh, with the timeout. A mind nourished upon anatomical study is, of course, permeated with the suggestion of the vagueness and instability of biological species. A biological species is quite obviously a great number of unique individuals which is separable from other biological species only by the fact that an enormous number of other linking individuals are inaccessible in time, are in other words dead and gone, and each new individual in that species does, in the distinction of its own individuality, break away in however infinitesimal degree from the previous average properties of the species. There is no property of any species even the properties that constitute the specific definition that is not a matter of more or less. If, for example, a species be distinguished by a single large red spot on the back, you'll find if you go over a great number of specimens that red spot shrinking here to nothing, expanding there to a more general redness, weakening to pink, deepening to a russet and brown, shading into crimson, and so on and so on. And this is true not only of biological species, it is true of the mineral specimens constituting a mineral species. A mineral species. And I remember as a, a constant refrain in the lectures of Professor Judd upon rock classification the words, they pass into one another by insensible gradations. That is true, I hold, of all things. You will think perhaps of atoms of the elements as instances of identically similar things, but these are things not of experience but of theory, and there is not a phenomenon in chemistry that is not equally well explained on the supposition that it is merely the immense quantities of atoms necessarily taken in any experiment that mass by the operation of the law of averages the fact that each atom also has its unique quality, its special individual differences. In other words, its quantum state. 
These idea of un uh, this idea of uniqueness in all individuals is not only true of the classifications of material science, it is true, and still more evidently true, of the species of common thought. It is true of common terms. Take the word chair. When one says chair, one thinks vaguely of an average chair. But collect individual instances. Think of armchairs and reading chairs and dining room chairs and kitchen chairs, chairs that pass into benches, chairs that cross the boundary and become settees, dentists, chairs, thrones, opera stalls, seats of all sorts, those miraculous fungoid growths that uh, uh, cumber the floor of the arts and crafts exhibition, and you will perceive what a lax bundle, in fact, is this simple, straightforward term. In cooperation with an intelligent joiner, I would undertake to defeat any definition of chair or cherishness that you gave me. Chairs, just as much as individual organisms, just as much as mineral and rock specimens, are unique things. If you know them well enough, you will find an individual difference even in a set of machine-made chairs. And it is only because we do not possess minds of unlimited capacity, because our brain has only a limited number of pigeonholes for our correspondence with an unlimited universe of objective uniques, that we have to delude ourselves into the belief that there is a cherishness in this species common to and distinct, distinctive of all chairs. And that's exactly what objective metaphysics and epistemology requires. Because if it's, it's, it has to do with, classically, if something is to belong to a set, it's supposed to have necessary and sufficient conditions inherent in it. So you can always tell there is no blurry edge to sets in, in classical logic. That's what that's what we're all dealing with, those of us addressing this. Um, okay. Let me repeat, this is of the very smallest importance in all the practical affairs of life, or indeed in relation to anything but philosophy and wide generalizations, but in philosophy it matters profoundly. If I order two new laid eggs for breakfast, up come two unhatched but still unique avian individuals, and the chances are they serve my rude physiological purpose. I could afford to ignore the hen's eggs of the past that were not quite so nearly this sort of thing, and the hen's eggs of the future that will accumulate modifications age by age. I can venture to ignore the rare chance of an abnormality in chemical composition and of any startling aberration in my physiological reaction. I can, with a confidence that is practically perfect, say with unqualified simplicity, two eggs, but not of my concern it's not my morning breakfast, but the utmost possible truth. Now let me go on to point out whither this idea of uniqueness tends. I submit to you that syllogism is based on classification. Syllogism, law, logic, yes. That's the whole point. And after this paper, math was refounded on set theory, classification. I submit to you that syllogism is based on classification, that all hard logical reasoning tends to imply and is apt to imply a confidence in the objective reality of classification. Again, this, you know, that, that's not even controversial at this point. Um, consequently, in denying that, that, I deny the absolute validity of logic. Classification and number, which in truth ignore the fine differences of objective realities, have in the past of human thought been imposed upon things. Let, let me, for clearness' sake, take liberty here, commit, as you may perhaps think, an unpardonable insolence. Hindu thought and Greek thought alike impress me as being overmuch obsessed by an objective treatment of certain necessary preliminary conditions of human thought, number and definition, and class and abstract form. But these things, number, definition, class, and abstract form, I hold, are merely unavoidable conditions of mental activity regrettable conditions rather than essential facts. The forceps of our mind are clumsy forceps and crush the truth a little in taking hold of it. It was about this difficulty that the mind of Plato played a little inconclusively all his life. Oh my God, I just, I, I practically raptured when I got to the point of him talking about Plato because this is what I've said this many times that Plato's form was like a deification of an idea he says the form is perfect, the real thing is an imperfect copy, and it's the other way around. Oh, I, having H.G. Wells write that was awesome. <coughs> it was about this difficulty that the mind of Plato played a little inconclusively all his life, 
For the most part, he tended to regard the idea as the something behind reality, where it seems to me that the idea is the more proximate and less perfect thing, the thing by which the mind, by ignoring individual differences, attempts to comprehend an otherwise unimaginable number of unique realities. Let me give you a rough figure of what I'm trying to convey in this first attack upon the philosophical validity of general terms. You have seen the results of these various methods of black and white reproduction that involve the use of a rectangular net. You know the sort of process picture I mean. You guys probably don't. It, it's, but anyway, it, it used to be employed very frequently in reproducing photographs. At a little distance, you really seem to have a faithful reproduction of the original picture. But when you peer closely, you find not the unique form and masses of the original, but a multitude of little rectang rectangles, uniform in shape and size. The more earnestly you go into the thing, the closer you look, the more the picture is lost in reticulations. In other words, it's like a pixels. I submit the world of reason inquiry as a very similar relation to the world I call objectively real. For the rough purposes of every day, the network picture will do, but the finer your purpose is, the less it will serve, and for an ideally fine purpose for absolute and general knowledge, that will be as true for a man at a distance with a telescope as for a man with a microscope, it will not serve at all. It is true you can make your, logic, your net of logical interpretation finer and finer, you can find your classification more and more up to a certain limit, but essentially you are working in limits, and as you come closer, as you look at finer and subtler things, as you leave the, pract you leave the practical purpose for which the method exists, the element of error increases. Every species is vague, every term goes cloudy at its edges, and so in my way of thinking, relentless logic is only another phrase for stupidity, for a sort of intellectual pig-headedness. If you push a philosophical or metaphysical inquiry through a series of valid syllogisms, never committing any generally recognized fallacy, you nevertheless leave a certain rubbing and marginal loss of objective truth, and you get deflections that are difficult to trace, and at each phase in the process. Every species waggles about in its definition. Every tool is a little loose in its handle. Every scale has its individual error. So long as you are reasoning for practical purposes about finite things of experience, you can every now and then check your process, correct your adjustments but not when you make what are called philosophical and theological inquiries when you turn your implement towards the final absolute truth of things. Doing that is like firing at an inaccessible, unmarkable, and indestructible target at an unknown distance with a defective rifle and variable cartridges. Even if by chance you hit, you cannot know that you hit, and so it will matter nothing at all. This assertion of the necessary untrustworthiness of all reasoning processes arising out of the fallacy of classification in what is quite conceivably a universe of uniques forms only one introductory aspect of my general skepticism of the instrument of thought. But that's ten minutes, so I don't know if I'll finish this. He has a couple other things about negation and stuff. But right there, that's the embodied mind. This guy, H.G. Wells invented cognitive science.